to all the naysayers, to everyone who said this wouldn't work or proposed better ideas, well, I have just one thing to say to you. You were right. Try as I might, I haven't for the life of me been able to keep this set up from either throwing or outright breaking chains. I think my record runtime was about 30 seconds. I had decided on multi-stage reductions. With the setup you could see here, in addition to this second idler, I could get this to 15 to 1. There's a sprocket pair using the drive shaft as a jack shaft idler. This is mounted on bearings. And the second set was to live up here. This would provide the final drive reduction. I haven't been able to figure out what's going on exactly, though maybe it's a combination of things. The alignment is spot on. I don't know if it's perhaps the end play in my saw clutch. Maybe these used gears are just too worn out, but the whole setup was just very sensitive. And that's here sort of on my bench. The back end of this cart is using a pair of self-aligning bearings. So that means as this goes down the road, there's going to be some deflection in the drive shaft. And again, seeing how sensitive this is, I don't know, it just isn't giving me the warm fuzzies. My next thought was to go to an independent mounting plate for all of the gearing. Maybe to a final belt drive to the wheels. Or perhaps going back to the worm drive. But after seeing just how fast 10 plus K RPM is on the saw, and the fact that it'd be immediately behind my kids sitting in a thin plastic seat, well, some re-engineering was in order. And after mentally adding up all the new parts I'd need, and the sheer amount of pain in the buttery, I started to consider what I was trying to avoid from the beginning, which is throwing money at the problem. When I found this on eBay, eBay never ceases to amaze me. For less than $200 shipped, I got this engine with new sprockets and chain. And to me, that was more than worth my kids' incessant are we there yet. Now, for that price, this is an import, of course, offshore. But it's a pull start, four-stroke engine. So right off the bat, it's going to be slower speed, probably around 3,000 RPM. It also comes with this CVT like transmission. So it's already got effectively like a built-in clutch and variable speed. There are two variable pulleys in here under spring load that open and close based on the engine speed and the load on that pinion. And if this thing actually works, it should be a good fit for what I'm trying to do. It should be safer and less temperamental. According to the ad, it's a, a bit bigger than my chainsaw engine too. It's a 50 cc, two and a half horsepower. Again, it's pull start, though it didn't really come with a fuel tank, so I'll have to figure that out. I'm not gonna redo everything I sort of did in part one, so I'm just gonna mount this. It's just gonna be four bolts and a hub for the sprocket. I'll do that off screen, and for this video, I'm just gonna move on to the front end of this go-kart frame. So the front end is a little tricky for a couple of reasons. First, it needs to match the back end. Width and height off the ground are already set. Basically, I don't have as much freedom to do what I want here at the front because the back is already built. Second, it'd be nice if this cart could actually steer. I'll need to build up some brackets, bushings, pins, that sort of stuff, so the wheels move the way I want them to, or the way I think I want them to. All of that steering stuff would live sort of in this space between the inside of the wheels and the front end of the frame. I'm basically starting with the wheels and working my way in towards the center. Let me make some parts first. These are just some cutoffs, sort of look about right. Maybe not the ideal size, but again, what I have on hand. I'm gonna start with the U-bracket. I don't know exactly what it's called, but the fixed part of the pivot that'll be attached to the frame. I need to bend a couple of these pieces up and they'll support sort of the axis of rotation of steering for the wheel. So this is my import bender. This is mounted across the bench from the bender you saw in the last video. I don't have a die for the other bender that'll do sort of sharp 90 degree bends and that's why I keep this thing around. I've broken and had to repair this bender more times than I can count. So with this thicker stuff, I'm gonna heat this up with the torch and give my bender a fighting chance.
So these are the basic building blocks of the hinge, the yoke, the spindle supports. I'm not exactly sure what these are called. This part I'll attach to the frame, and this is what the wheel steers around. I've got to dress these up a bit, clean this spindle arm support up, and I want to make some Delrin bushings just to fill out these spaces and keep the motion nice and fluid. So here's hoping you can make this out. I've done a little bit of layout directly on the bench. I put the seat in sort of for context and that's the center line of the cart. The two outside chalk lines are the outside sort of the wheelbase as set up by the back end. I know now how much space I need for each front wheel. I'm giving it another inch so I have some space for material to play with the steering angles, kingpin angles. And it leaves me with an inside dimension of 13 and a half inches. 34 centimeters. I'm going to start to bend this front end and it's got to sort of flare out, hopefully you can see this, to meet up with the width of the back end at some point along its length. For now I just think I'll leave the material long and worry about that later. So my apology for not showing you all those bends, but it got a little bit hairy there. The swing in the bender for a tube this long just kept running into the tripod, knocking stuff over. It was just too much stuff to keep track of at once. I've got something close to a 45 that picks up the bottom part of the frame and creates sort of a, I guess what you should call the bumper. There is a jog here right behind the wheels, just to give me some clearance for turning. And there's a second part, or the top part of the frame, that has the same jog. It's going to fit about here, and I'll fill this with some gussets. I haven't completely fleshed out the frame yet. I put only enough in the front end to keep it together while I work out the axle geometry. It's also longer than it needs to be, and I have it blocked up to final height. There isn't a lot of structure currently across the short axis. Really, there's just this, I guess, front bumper. I'm under no illusions that the front and back halves of this frame would mate smoothly. I mean, I've given it my best shot, but the single connecting tube gives me a chance to push, pull, and bend to sort of get them to match up. Once happy, I can add more structure. This next bit is quite important. How these wheels attach to the cart have the single biggest impact on, you know, the whole karting experience. Now, I'm no Formula One mechanic. Not since I installed Stefan's wheels backwards and he came in last driving in reverse. So take this with a grain of salt. I'm essentially taking a guess based on half hour Google crash course in steering geometry. What I really wanted to do was install these kingpins out a little bit further from the frame so I had a little bit more room to play with. Despite my best intentions, it didn't quite work out that way, so I'm going to be in pretty close. The first thing I want to do is give the bracket a bit of rearward rotation. That does nothing for the handling, 
but it gives me some clearance for the tie rods that will eventually go to this steering column. Second, I'm going to give the kingpin about 20 degrees of caster angle. That's kind of a backwards lean, maybe a smidge more. I don't want the steering to be too heavy, but then again, I don't know what I'm doing, so really I have little control over how this turns out. And finally, I want to put in about 10 degrees of camber. That's an inward lean at the top of the kingpin. The combination of those three angles make for quite the strange orientation. Let me tack this in place and we'll talk about what all these angles are meant to do. Now that I have the front wheels on, I can put the two frame halves together. With the two frame halves together, I can start to build in the steering geometry. Well, I'll be if that isn't starting to look like something. The frames are still separate. I just have them blocked up. I'm playing with the length a bit. Again, the seat is just sort of sitting there in a piece of pipe. And in order to locate that seat, I had to install the new engine. Let's go take a look around the back. Now, again, I only mounted the engine because I needed to know its relative position in the cart in order to attach both halves of the frame together. The drive shaft still has the old bicycle sprockets on it. I've yet to add the new larger sprocket, though I think I want to think that through. I'm not sure what that's going to do with that CVT on the engine. I'm pretty sure it's still going to need a gear reduction. At most, that's going to be, I don't know, one to do reduction in the CVT, maybe one to three. And my target on the wheels is still around that seven, eight, nine hundred RPM mark. The engine is up on a pair of the same size tubing that I've used for the frame. I had to do a little bit of a jog on the right to avoid the brake caliper. The brake caliper sort of sticks up out of the top, something like that, but I've got to spin the brake line around on the caliper so it's pointing up towards the front. Now with this mock-up on the bench, I've found an error that I made in the distance between the front wheels, like the width of the front end. I think I double dipped on a measurement. I started measuring from the center line to try to keep everything equally spaced. I thought I'd made the frame too wide so I had to bring the wheels in but the frame is just fine and now the wheels are too tight. I'm gonna have to separate kind of this kingpin axle joint and move them out a bit like I'd planned to in the beginning. While I'm reworking the front end I'm gonna change these kingpin angles. 20 degrees sounded good but now that I'm looking at it it just seems much too aggressive. I think this steering is gonna be way too heavy for my kids. I don't know if you can make out how much this frame jacks when I turn these wheels. I mean, that's the effect I'm looking for, but it just feels like too much. I think I'm going to drop it down to maybe 12 or 15 degrees. I have the two halves of the frame set apart at the length that I want. I've got about 12 inches of overlap that I'm just going to sort of cut right through. And I think I've got this little stainless tubing here. That's a really snug fit. I think I'm going to drive it a couple of inches in each side, push it together, and weld up that butt joint, trying to get through to a little bit of that stainless. It'll be gusseted, of course, but I'll take all the help I can get. Splicing these together was going to be a bit of a trick because that would set how parallel the front and rear axles are. But since I'm now cutting off the kingpins, I can adjust for that when I'm welding those back on. So this is the perimeter of the frame. It's really just all tacked together. I'll need to carefully sort of take off all the hardware, clean it up really nice, and finish out those welds. I'm happy to report that it's still quite light. 
I mean, it's missing a lot of its cross bracing and all of the structure that'll hold the seat and the steering column and the pedals and all that stuff, but I think weight-wise, I'm still doing pretty good. It actually looks a little long in this shot here, but bumper to bumper, this thing turned out to be four feet long, almost right on the nose. It's uh, about 120 centimeters. I'm not sure if that's big or small, but the proportions look about right. So I think I'm gonna call this part two. And in part three, we'll do the controls, you know, gas and brake pedal up at the front, steering column, maybe we'll fab a small gas tank, and we'll take this thing for a spin. Thanks for watching.